Well, good morning. It's, it's uh, good to be with you again. As Clint mentioned, I was here in April, uh, back in the spring, and um, had the privilege of preaching for you then. And it's always nice to be invited back. Uh, as Clint mentioned before, when, when I came down, I was on staff at Capitol Hill Baptist Church up in Washington, D.C. And now I'm a church planter that's moved to Asheville, North Carolina in the hopes of seeing a thriving gospel witness established in that city. So being a church planter means that if possible, uh, I have less time on my hands than I did before and certainly less money. Uh, so you can pray for us in that. Pray that the Lord would provide for us financially and in every other way. And uh, pray for our work. Pray that the Lord would establish a blazing and thriving gospel witness in a very dark place uh, called Asheville, North Carolina. I like to refer to it often as the hole in the Bible belt, uh, which I think is accurate because it's a lot like a, a Portland, Oregon got dropped off in the mountains of North Carolina. It has a very liberal and secular culture, and it's a very dark place. And my hope is that in a few years, when people think of Asheville, North Carolina, they don't just think mountains and it's a pretty place. They don't just think about beer and marijuana and maybe some good restaurants, but they also think about a really healthy church that makes much of Jesus Christ and that exists for the glory of God. So pray along with us that the Lord would do that. I am grateful uh, for Freedom Church, and I'm especially grateful for your pastor. He is a, a dear brother in Christ, and he's a good friend. He and Rachel have been a tremendous encouragement to my wife and I. And I, I like Clint for a lot of reasons, but most especially because he's passionate about seeing lost people come to know Jesus, and he's passionate about seeing the saints built up in the faith. And I like dudes like that, and I like hanging out with dudes like that. So, Clint, it's good to see you, man. Appreciate you having me. Well, as part of our church planting effort up in the mountains, we have started a weekly Bible study, and we're going through the book of Ephesians. And Clint, being the great guy that he is, told me I could pick my text. So we've just gotten through the early parts of Ephesians chapter 2, and so I chose Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. And as Clint said, I think it's one of the sweetest passages in all of the Bible. And some of you who are familiar with it, you might think like, you know, bro, that's kind of hedging your bets to pick a text like that because you could just get up and read it and sit down and it would be an edifying time. And that's, that's true. Uh, hopefully, though, we'll be, we'll be gleaning a lot of good stuff from the text. And uh, I pray that the Lord will do a great work in our midst today. I'm not big on sermon titles, uh, but if I'd had to give this a title, I think I'd call it The Gospel, Straight, No Chaser. I think... That's pretty accurate. This is one of the greatest passages in Scripture in terms of just what we were on our own, by ourselves, in and of ourselves, and then what God in His grace and mercy has done for us in Jesus. And so we're going to spend our time this morning thinking about this, looking at the text, and rejoicing over what's there. And before uh, we do that, I want to pray, and then we'll dive in. So pray with me. Our Father, it is good to gather together today to sing praises to your name and to pray to you, to praise you, to hear your word read, and now to be able to hear your word preached. We pray that you would send your Holy Spirit, that your spirit would fill me as the preacher, and that your spirit would fall on all who listen. Give everyone in this building eyes to see and ears to hear. And we know that if your spirit doesn't come, we're wasting our time. So we ask you to do it. We ask you to send your spirit for our good and for your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to begin our time this morning with a question. Do you consider yourself to be a realist? Do you consider yourself to be a realist? I think we all want to answer that question, yes. We want to be people who face the facts. We want to be people who understand the realities of life. We don't want to be naive. We don't want to be misguided. We don't want to be misinformed. And friend, I, I want you to know, and the Lord wants you to know, that His Word, the Bible, gives us the facts about ourselves. It gives us the facts about the world we live in. It gives us the facts about God's plan of redemption and what He's doing in the world that He made. And so we, if we're going to be realists in every good sense of that word, need to come to grips with everything that the Lord has revealed here. And that's what we hope to do today. 
My goal today, because this is what the Apostle Paul's goal is in this passage, is to blow up any notions that you have that you are basically good. Or to blow up any notions that you have that you are even okay. And if you're a Christian, I want you to leave this place today knowing that you contributed absolutely nothing to your salvation. That God has done this. And I want you to see how that is good and how that is glorious and how you can leave here rejoicing in that truth. That our God has done it all. If you sit here today in Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, open them up to Ephesians chapter 2. And you have uh, the Gospels and Acts. You have the book of Romans. You have 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And then you have Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So we're right there in the middle of Paul's epistles. And while you're flipping there, I'm going to briefly sketch for you Ephesians chapter 1 so that you have an, a feel for where Paul has been and so that we can better understand what we're going to hear today. Paul begins his letter uh, with thanksgiving, basically praising the Lord for what he has done, what God has done in the Ephesian Christians, in choosing them before the foundation of the world, in adopting them as sons, in giving them redemption through the blood of Jesus, in bringing them into this one body called the church. So the Jews and the Gentiles have both been brought together through Jesus into one body called the church. And Paul has been praising God for that in Ephesians 1. And then at the very end of the chapter, he praised the Lord for the Ephesian Christians. And he praised particularly that they would know three things, that they would know the hope to which they've been called, that they would know the riches of God's inheritance in them, the fact that God delights in saving them and that God delights that he will inherit them as his people. And then finally, he prays that they would know the power of God. And so what he gets ready to do here in chapter 2 is basically unpack what the power of God looks like in the life of the Christian. How God, through Jesus, has worked all things for their good in a mighty and glorious and powerful way. So that's what we're going to get here. He wants the Ephesian Christians to know the power of God and their salvation, what God has done for them, and how he's united all believers, Jew and Gentile and every other kind, into this one body called the church. So put your eyes down on your Bible now in Ephesians 2 and chapter 1. And I'm going to read the passage. And then what you need to do is keep your Bible open during this sermon. It will be much more engaging if you do because we're going to go phrase by phrase through this text. And I'm going to have you looking at it a lot. Because it doesn't matter what my opinions are. It doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the Lord has said. And that's what we're going to deal with today. So listen as I read Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, and because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. Paul, in this section, in these ten verses, basically gives the Ephesian Christians three exhortations. There are three things that he wants them to do. And thereby, there are three things, three exhortations that Paul would give to us. And that will be the outline of our sermon. And the first exhortation, the first point, is that Paul wants us to know, God, by his Spirit, wants us to know that we were dead. So point number one, know you were dead. So put your eyes on verse one, where it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. So how are we to understand that? How are we to understand that word dead? 
Because if you were to go out into the, the marketplace, if you were to go to your job on tomorrow, on Monday, and say, do you know what the pastor said about you, what the preacher said about you over the weekend, if you're talking to your non-Christian friend? He said you're dead. That person's probably going to look at you like you have lost it. You know, like you've, you've gone bonkers. What are you talking about dead? I, I walk around. I do stuff. I think. I feel. What do you mean dead? Well, we're talking about spiritual death here. And we're talking about like, the kind of death that is not so much related to not being able to walk or to think or to feel or to do stuff. People aren't dead because they can't do those things. People are dead because they can't see. They're dead because they can't see the truth about God and about themselves. They are blind. Paul's language is very severe here, and it's on purpose. He doesn't just say that we were sick and we needed to be made well. He doesn't just say that we've done some bad stuff and we need to behave a little better. He doesn't just say that we were dirty and we need to clean ourselves up a little bit. No, he doesn't say that at all. He says we were dead, and then what we need is resurrection. We need a miracle. Look down at verse 2. So not only were we dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked, we were also, Paul says, following the course of this world. And the way that I think it's helpful to understand this, think of a river or a stream that's flowing, and then think of a leaf or a piece of debris or something that's floating on top of that, that river or that stream, and it's just carried along by the current. That's the idea here, that we exist in this world and we're just being swept along and carried along by the world, by the course that it's on. We go the way the world is going. And which way is that? It's the exact opposite direction of God. We're going straight away from Him. And then Paul, also look back down at your text, he also says, not only are we following the course of this world, we are following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Well, who is that? It's Satan. The prince of the power of the air is the devil. So not only are we following the course of this world, we are following Satan. And I don't know about you, but when I have conversations with people, wherever I have them, you know, at work or at the store or the restaurant, people, by default, we tend to think that we're free. We tend to think that we just make of ourselves what we will, that there's nothing outside of us that has us in any kind of bondage, and that we're just sort of free agents. I don't think the Bible allows that kind of thinking. Like, let's get this straight, that we are serving someone or something. We are bond servants, to use a biblical word, of somebody, either God or Satan. No other option. It's always been the case. From Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, you, you hear the Lord talk about the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. There are children of God and children of their father, the devil, Jesus would say in John 8. There are people whose names are in the Lamb's book of life and then people's names who aren't there. There are two kinds of people in the world. And people will often act like becoming a Christian means surrendering their freedom, means surrendering their liberty, like it's the first time they're going to be under authority of any kind. That's just not true. And we need to help folks understand that. Because in being in service to God, it's the first time that you actually become free in your entire life. We just sang a song, if the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. Amen. To be a servant of the Lord is to be free. To be a servant of Satan is to be in bondage and slavery. The Apostle Paul wants us to understand, and I'm speaking to Christians right now, he wants the Christian to understand how bad our situation was and how helpless we were. Being dead in our trespasses and sins, when's the last time you saw a dead man open his own casket? How many people do you see climbing out of their own graves when you go to the cemetery? That's right, none, zero. A dead man can't do anything to help himself. We were following the course of the world. We just thought about the idea of a piece of debris or a leaf being carried along by the current of a river. Well, what kind of leaf can remove itself from that kind of flowing water? It can't. We just thought about being in bondage to Satan. And unless you have a really high opinion of yourself, I don't think anybody in this room is going to claim to be more powerful than the devil. So if Satan has you in bondage and means to keep you there, 
Somebody other than you is going to have to set you free. This isn't some kind of like jailbreak scheme where you're going to get one up on the old devil. I don't think so. Somebody stronger than Satan is going to have to liberate you from that kind of bondage. You can't do it yourself. Paul wants you to know that if you're a believer. There's no way that your salvation was ultimately up to you. That's crazy talk. If you had been the one who thought, you know, I think I'm going to get saved now and I'm just going to whip the devil and escape that kind of bondage. I'm going to be stronger than this current of the world that I'm floating in and I'm somehow going to resurrect myself. No, it's not, it's not what the Bible teaches. The Lord had to do this. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I don't, I don't have any good news for you if you, if you remain in this predicament, if you remain in this situation, if you remain dead and a slave to the world and a slave to Satan, I have no good news for you other than to tell you that the God of the universe has sent his son to die for your sin, to live a perfect life that you could not live, to be resurrected from the dead, conquering death forever. He ascended to heaven. He's at the right hand of God, and he's going to come back for everybody who turns from their sin and trusts in him for their salvation. That's the only good news that I or we as Christians can offer you. And it's the greatest news in the world. So I would plead with you, if you have not turned from your sin, if you have not turned from following the course of this world and the course of Satan, do it today and trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation. Because the situation that you find yourself in, my friend, is horrible. There's not strong enough language that exists in English for me to express how bad your predicament is. Look down at verse 3. Paul tells us that we all, among whom we all, the sons of disobedience there, we all used to be that. We all once lived amongst the sons of disobedience in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind. So this is Paul again making it crystal clear that every Christian, no exception, used to be a son of disobedience. Used to live this way. Every Christian, every human, was carried along by the course of the world and ruled by Satan and also were slaves of their desires and passions. And so they acted, we acted in accord with those passions and those desires. To which somebody might object, somebody might say, well, hold up a minute, bro. If you're telling me that, that I was a slave of Satan and just being carried along by the course of the world and I'm also a slave to my desires, how, how am I responsible? How is, how is it wrong for me to just act on a desire that I have? couple of things. One, after the fall, after our first parents, Adam and Eve, sin, the way things are no longer equals the way things ought to be. So just because you have a desire as a fallen human doesn't mean that it's all right. It doesn't mean that just because you were born in a particular way desiring this particular thing, that that desire is okay. God's word is what tells us whether that desire is okay or not. We're all born messed up. We're all born corrupted and broken and fallen, and we all have wicked desires. So it's not an excuse before God to say, well, I was just doing what I wanted. I had these desires. You made me this way, God. Not an excuse. The Bible doesn't allow it. And then to say, how could I really be guilty if I'm enslaved to these things? Well, the Bible doesn't allow that either. The Bible is crystal clear that God is sovereign, that Satan is real, and that he's powerful, and all of that stuff. And at the same time, we are really guilty because we have all happily joined in the rebellion against God, actively joined in the rebellion against God. And we are really responsible for choosing whether or not we will trust in Jesus and whether or not we will turn from our sin. The question isn't, do we have a choice to make? The question is, why do we choose what we choose? And we're going we're to explore that later. But don't let for one second any of this confuse you into thinking that you're just a robot. That's not true. The Bible does not allow it. Look back down at verse 3. Paul tells us that not only were we following the desires of the body and the mind, we were by nature children of wrath. So what are we to make of that? Paul's telling us we're sinners by nature. He's saying this is what you are by default. To use a, a sprinting analogy, you have come out of the blocks. You have begun this race as a sinner. 
You've begun the race wicked, fallen, and depraved. Just to quote a little bit of Bible to you, we were conceived in iniquity and brought forth in sin, Psalm 51. From before birth, we were called rebels, Isaiah 48. Sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin, Romans 5. To illustrate this just a little bit more, uh, some of you might have met my son, Josiah. He's eight months old. He's in the nursery over there. Hopefully he's behaving himself. We'll see. Um, he's really cute. Most people think so. You can check him out after the service and you can be the judge of that. And when he's around people, he, he often does pretty well in terms of his behavior because he seems to like folks. As long as somebody's in his face paying him attention, he's usually pretty happy. Um, Nick, one of the guys that came down with me today, upset him this morning, but that's, that's just because he was tired. Uh, but Josiah, as cute as he is, and as sweet as he may seem, I'm telling you right now, he is dead in his trespasses and sins. And, I mean, it may be kind of funny, but it's no laughing matter. He's a sinner. He's wicked. He's depraved. He's eight months old, and we already see it. He, whenever he doesn't get his way, he freaks out. We see anger already, like just exploding out of him. He's eight months old. We're not going to have to teach him to defy us. He's already doing it. All that's happening with my eight-year-old boy is that poison that runs through his veins called sin is just coming out. We're all born like that. And if you want to tell me or argue with me and say, hey, you know, I just don't know that that's, that's fair, that we're born sinners. Surely we're all born pretty good and then like we become sinners when we do something bad. Like we're born with an equal shot at being sinful or being righteous. That sounds better. Well, I would just say to that, my friend, there's 7 billion people living on planet Earth right now. Forget everybody who's already lived. 7 billion people alive right now. Every one of them's a sinner. And to me, if there was a shot, like in any kind of percentage, that you could be okay on your own, surely to goodness, if you flip a coin 7 billion times, it wouldn't come up tails every time. Like this, it just does not happen. Everybody who's born sins. And we sin because we're sinners. This is the doctrine called original sin. It's in Scripture, though that term is not used like that. We are by nature children of wrath. We're born sinners. We are born enemies of God, and that's what Paul is telling us. We're children of wrath. One way we know that we're born with sin in us and that we have sin in us is that God's offended with us. He's offended by us. He's going to condemn us because that's what we deserve, and God doesn't condemn innocent people. He's not offended with innocent people. God's offended by sinful people. So the fact that the holy God of the universe, because he's good, has a problem with us and our sin indicates that there's something wrong with us because he's perfectly just and good. He doesn't, unlike us, he doesn't get mad for no reason. So that's an indication that we're sinners. And to clear up any confusion as to whether this is universal, Paul adds the phrase there at the end of verse 3, like the rest of mankind, everybody, like we were just talking about. Seven billion out of seven billion sinners, every one. So why does this all matter? All of this stuff that we've been camping out on here for 15 minutes. Seems kind of morbid, doesn't it? Depressing maybe that we're this bad and we're this wrecked and messed up. Well, it matters for several reasons. We could unpack many, but I'm, for sake of time right now, I'll unpack three. This matters for the Christian because... If you're a Christian, you need to understand what you've been rescued from. You need to understand what God has saved you from. The gospel will not sound as good to you as it should unless you get this. So if you're a Christian here today, I would ask you this question. Are you amazed that you are one? Are you amazed that you're a Christian? I understand in our bad moments, we might not all be. But in your good moments, are you astonished? that you love God and that you desire to obey Him and that you want to be with Him forever and that you actually hate your sin? Are you amazed by that? Because you ought to be if you understand what you were. And I would agree with Martin Lloyd-Jones when he says that if you're not amazed that you're a Christian, you have no reason to think that you are one. And my friend, if you're sitting here today and you're new to Christianity, you're, you're not a believer, 
you've come here because you thought, you know, I want to go check out church on a Sunday morning, see what this Christianity stuff's all about. We're glad you're here. There's no better place for you to be than in a church like this where the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached. If that's you and you're currently not trusting in Christ for your salvation, my friend, bef before anything good is going to happen to you in terms of your salvation, you need to understand the truth about yourself apart from Jesus. You need to know what you are now apart from Jesus Christ. Or you're never going to understand why you need him. The gospel will sound absolutely ridiculous to you if you do not understand that you are this, that you are dead in your sins, that you're a slave of Satan and a slave of your desires and you're following the course of the world and that God in his goodness will condemn you. So when I pray for non-believing family and friends that I'm sharing the gospel with, one of the first things, of course, I always pray, God, save them. But even more specifically than that, I will pray, Lord, convict them of their sin. Show them what they are before you so that they will then see their need for your son. And finally, this is important for us, again, talking about being realists and understanding the world we live in. If you don't get this, if you don't get Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, you are going to be just all kinds of confused about the world that you live in. You're not going to be able to understand much at all. And just, I mean, to illustrate my point, you can just turn on the television and watch the news and listen to very educated people talk about what's going on in the world. And they'll talk about things like, you know, this is just not how you act in the 21st century. You know, killing people for this or that. We are progressive we are getting better. Human beings are on this good trajectory. We just can't have this kind of nonsense happening in our modern world today. Well, my friend, I would tell you that is naive to think that we're getting better. Surely, I mean, a couple of world wars and 9-11 and some other things and the genocide that we've seen in Africa and the things that we see going on in the Middle East right now would convince us that human beings are not getting better. And this text helps us understand why not. Because apart from Jesus Christ and apart from the gospel and apart from the work of God's spirit, we're wicked. We're dead. The only good news, the only hope we have in this fallen world is this good news of Jesus Christ. And apart from that, your utopian notions and your progressive instincts, they are meaningless, worthless. They'll never happen. They're a pipe dream. Now, that doesn't mean, please, I'm just going to add this really quickly for us in the church. Sometimes we have these little intramural discussions about how bad the world is. I would also say that there's nothing new under the sun. The Lord says that in Ecclesiastes. Human nature hasn't changed since Genesis 3. So the idea that things are a whole lot worse than they've always been is really not true either. It's just this is how it's been for several thousand years. This is how it's been because of these verses. So if these things are true, and they are, how on earth can anyone ever be saved? That's a question worth pondering for the rest of your life. But we're going to look at it now for the next few minutes. So how can anybody be saved if these things are true? So Paul, number one, wanted the Ephesian Christians to know they were dead. Number two, he wants them to behold the power of God. So point number two, behold the power of God. And behold is just a, it's like a biblish word for like look at something. Uh, you know, stand in amazement, survey it, assess it, take hold of it, deal with it. So do all those things with the power of God. Understand it. Especially how it's worked in, for your good in Jesus. So look down at verse 4. You see those first two words, but God. So we were dead following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, slaves of our passions and desires, by nature children of wrath, like everybody else, but God. And I also I'll, I'll agree with Martin Lloyd-Jones yet another time. He says that this is perhaps the greatest but in the Bible. I think he's right. But, it's a contrastive word, right? Here's how things were, but, here's what God did. But God. God has done something. And this is how the gospel always comes. Because things are bad in this world. The gospel always comes with this kind of thing. Human beings are this, and the world is like this, and it's really bad, but God. 
Our salvation is all, not mostly, not a little bit, but all a result of God's initiative, of God's acting. And frankly, the whole Bible is that, my friend. It's an account of the actions of God in His world. And God has had to overcome a lot to save us. A lot. Put your eyes back down on verse 4. It says, God, being rich in mercy, and because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. Think about that for a moment. Our salvation, all of it, is ascribed to what? The two things, God's mercy and then God's love. We've got to come to grips with the fact that we didn't deserve salvation. And just to make that point even stronger, Paul tells us that God did all this while we were still dead. You see that? It makes me think of Romans 5, 8. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, the Bible is riddled with passages like this where we are to understand that we don't bring anything to the table. It's not because we deserve something. It's not because we have merited it. Mercy equals not getting what you deserve. So the opposite of mercy is what? Justice. Sometimes we're programmed to think like the opposite of mercy equals unfairness or the opposite of mercy equals injustice. Because if God's merciful to one person, he's got to be merciful to everybody. Well, that's just poor thinking. The opposite of mercy is justice. So if you don't get mercy, you get justice from God. If you want fair, then you need to go find another religion. Because we, ours is a religion where we get better than fair. We get mercy from Almighty God. So don't misunderstand what mercy is. And don't misunderstand what fairness would look like from the holy God of the universe. I love the fact that Paul says it's because of God's richness in mercy and because of his great love for us. This is the kind of God we have, y'all. This is the kind of God we serve. Makes me think of Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, where the Lord reveals his name to Moses. What does he say? He says, I'm the Lord, the Lord, a God what? Merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And at the same time, I'll, no, I'll by no means clear the guilty. This is our God. So that's where the gospel comes in. Like, how does God do this? How does he not clear the guilty but then show mercy and love to sinners? The answer is, there's only one, the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ, where God's mercy and love embrace his justice. And he saves sinners through the atoning death of his son. And in order for us to wrap our minds around how merciful this is, I want to tell you a, a story, a brief one. Imagine with me for a moment that you were the son or, or the daughter of a, of a very powerful man, a powerful, your dad was powerful. And you were a, a pretty wicked kid. Your dad was a good man. And you asked him, basically for, Dad, everything that you were ever going to do for me, money, cars, possessions, whatever you were going to give me, like when you die, I want it now. Because I want to go do my own thing. I'm sick of you. I'm sick of this household. I'm getting out of here. So he, being a loving father, gives you that. He gives you some money, gives you a car. He gives you your inheritance, if you will. And then you go off and you blow it. You, you blow money. You live however you want. You live like hell. You follow your desires, your passions. You follow the course of the world. A few years later, you've got nothing, and your life is a wreck, and you know that it is, and you come to your senses, and you think, you know, my dad's got people who work for him that are doing a whole lot better than I am. I'm going to go back and see if, if dad will give me a job or let me do some work around the house for room and board or something. I hope that he'll do that for me. He may want to have nothing to do with me, though. And if he doesn't, I understand. So you go back to your dad, and you say, Dad, I want, to, I want to work. Like, my life's a disaster. If you don't ever want to see me again, I understand it. 
And instead of being angry with you, he gives you a hug, puts clothes on you, gives you some nice things, says, hey, you know, son, daughter, we're going to celebrate tonight. Because you were lost and now you're found. You were dead. Now you're alive. That's the kind of mercy this is. That's a story that Jesus told, called the prodigal son. That's representative of us, that we were running from the Lord, that we hated him, that we did everything that he would tell us not to do, and we didn't want to have anything to do with him. But yet, instead of giving us what we deserve, he gives us mercy. He puts clothes on our back, figuratively, puts rings on our hands, and we celebrate. He rejoices over every sinner who's repenting and trusting in him. We serve a loving and merciful God. It's a good thing to go home and meditate on. Look down at verse 5. So you see that God's rich in mercy. He's got great love for you if you're a Christian. And even when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, what did he do? He made you alive. He made you alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. How is this being made alive? You were dead, you've been made alive. How is this especially illustrative of God's grace? How does it especially help us understand it? Well, because as we considered before, a dead man can do nothing. Absolutely nothing. He can't open his own casket. He can't move. He can't choose. He can't do much. If anything good's going to happen, God had to do it all. If you look down there at what the text says, you see the verb there in the middle of verse 5 is made. Well, who's the subject? Look back up to the beginning of verse 4. It's God. God made us alive. He did this. He is the one who is decisive in salvation. He is the one who takes initiative. He is the one who acts and who makes this a reality. How else could we understand these verses? There's really no other way but to say God did it. It's not like God built this really intricate, awesome salvation machine and then leaves it to you and me to run it. That's not what he did. The way that many talk today, even in the church, I mean, obviously we're talking about Christians here, the way that I hear many Christians talk, it makes me shudder sometimes because it almost sounds like they think they saved themselves with some help from God. You know, that they were enlightened in some way and therefore chose Jesus. And everybody else, fools as they are, didn't make the same good decision. Or maybe they grew up in a Christian home and had some proclivity to believe. My friend, if you think it, that's horrible theology. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that we could do nothing and contribute nothing, and the Lord in His mercy and in His love gave us life. That's the gospel. Like, that is the gospel. You were dead you deserved hell and wrath, and then through no real action of your own, other than what God has enabled, by giving you the ability to choose him, by giving you faith, by causing you to see yourself as you really are, and causing you to see his son as the most glorious thing in the universe, God did that for you, and now you're a Christian. And now you will spend eternity in heaven with God. That is the gospel. Nothing less than that is the biblical gospel. Unless we think that this is far-fetched, the Bible clearly teaches that dead men, they do what God says. Think with me for a moment about John 11, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus is dead in the tomb. He's been rotting for a few days. We know that because when Jesus gets to town, Lazarus' sisters are like, Lord, he's going to be smelling bad. You don't want to go anywhere near that tomb. He's been dead for a little while. But Jesus goes... And then what does he do? He just, he speaks. Doesn't, doesn't do anything other than that. He just says, Lazarus, come out. Well, what could Lazarus do? What could he do? Nothing. He's dead. So the one who, hey, who gave the command, get up, had to give him the life to do it. So Jesus gives the command, Lazarus, get up. And what happens? The dead man gets up, listens and obeys the voice of God and comes out of the tomb. That's how you got saved. That's how you got saved. And God said, Clint, live. And then dead man, dead man Clint, obeyed. He said, yeah, I'll, I'll live. I see now. I hear now. I love God now. I love my neighbors now. 
Didn't before, but I do now. That's how you got saved. One objection and one question that sometimes rises up in people when this kind of teaching is presented to them. They'll say, well, if this is true, then God's just going to save who he's going to save. We don't have anything to do. There's no role to play. So we don't need to worry about making any kind of decision for Jesus. God's going to make a decision for us, and that's all we need to worry about. Or we don't need to worry about sharing the gospel. God's going to save who he's going to save. We don't need to pray because God's going to do what he's going to do if he's sovereign like you're saying he is. Well, my friend, if those kinds of objections are welling up inside of you, first of all, pray that the Lord would help you to see and understand. Be humble beneath the word of God and understand that the Bible doesn't allow you to think like that. Because the God of the Bible is a God of means, not just ends. So God has determined that he's going to save sinners, but he's also determined the way in which he's going to do it. And that's through like what I'm doing right now, preaching the gospel. The message of God comes to people who are dead and by the spirit of God, by the power of God, they hear it and believe. And that's how people get saved. God also tells us that prayer is effective and that we are to pray without ceasing and that we are to make intercession and supplication for each other. Be a Bible person. Don't let your brain sit in authority over the Bible and judge it. And sometimes these truths, they will, they'll break our brains, to be quite honest. But as John Piper would say, it's better your mind be broken than the Scripture. And in thinking about this kind of grace and mercy and the way that the Lord saves, I can't, being in the Bible Belt especially, I think we've got to be thinking this way. We've got to see... Therefore, how horrible the heresy of legalism is. When we're going to teach people that Christianity is a list of rules, it's a list of do's and a list of don'ts, and if you obey well enough and you abstain from these things, then somehow you're going to make it to heaven and that's what it is to be a Christian. That is, that is false teaching. The Bible doesn't teach that. That confuses people as to how they're made right with God. So let none of us in this room ever talk like that. Look back down at verse 6. So God not only has made us alive, he has also done a couple of other things. He's raised us up with Jesus and he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. So friend, what this is saying is that because Jesus was raised from the dead, you and I will be too if we're believing in him. And then we'll be seated with him in heaven forever. I think you guys have a, a baptism service next week. Is that right? So you realize that baptism, think Romans 6, we've been baptized into the death of Christ in that we have also been raised with him. So baptism symbolizes that. You were buried with Jesus and then you were brought to life in Christ and you will dwell with him forever. So you go below the water in, an, in a realm of death and then you are raised to life in Christ. That's going to be represented for you all next week visibly when you have a baptism service. I pray somebody who's here today who isn't trusting in Christ will get baptized next week. That would be awesome. And these are glorious promises. Do you look down, look down at the language that's used here? He raised us up, past tense. Seated us with him, past tense. Seems like this is as good as done. At least that's how I understand it. This is no fragile thing. These are glorious promises, and they are rock solid if you're a believer. God has done this and will ultimately do it for you in Jesus. Praise be to his name that he will. So Freedom Church, how do these truths, how does this biblical gospel affect the way that you do church? It should. If we understand that people are dead in their sins and that only God can save them, that salvation is of the Lord, then certainly it's going to affect the way we think about reaching lost people. We're not going to think that you know, the amenities that we have, whether it's the coffee bar or the comfortable seats or maybe it's the really, you know, we've got a good worship leader who's got a pretty wicked voice and so therefore maybe people are going to come. And then, you know, once we sneak, sneak attack them and lure them into the door, we'll hit them with the gospel. You know, and that's, we're going to be like the world to win the world. No, I hope that you understand that that kind of thinking it just doesn't go hand in hand with this kind of theology that the Bible's full of. We need to do church in such a way 
where we are distinct from the world. We, do look, we look different from the world. We act different from the world. And then when people come in here, they see something that is unfamiliar. And they see something that they have no category for. They think, man, these people, they're, they're young, they're old, they're different ethnicities, they're different socioeconomic backgrounds. I can't explain this really in any sociological way or psychological way. These people have nothing in common other than this Jesus guy that they keep talking about. This is pretty compelling. They're either crazy or this is the work of God. That's what you want to have happen when people come into your church. So this attractional ministry philosophy nonsense, I hope we can just do away with it all together. I know that like our core group that we're trying to hopefully establish a church with up in Asheville, we, are, we talk about these things. We don't want to have a church that's, that looks like the world in order to win it because we don't think that's the way that you do it. And we get that kind of thinking from the gospel because we understand how people are saved. And what's, what's also amazing about this truth is how it creates unity in a church. It's amazing the kind of unity that can exist in a group of people who understand themselves to have been depraved and then to have been saved by nothing that they did other than the grace of God. That's what saved them. It's amazing the unity that's created in a place, in a church like that. And then finally, friends, this gospel, it should come to bear in your relationships. If you're a husband or a wife, how does the gospel come to bear in your marriage? If you understand that you married a sinner who was dead, and you yourself were a sinner who was dead, and now you're both redeemed sinners who are living, and you've been shown a ton of grace by God and forgiven a lot of sin by God, that should affect how you relate to one another. You ought to bear with one another in love. You ought to forgive one another when you wrong each other, because you will. We could apply the gospel to like literally anything. I just picked a couple, the church and marriage. You can apply it to everything. It's the most relevant thing in the world, this gospel. So Paul tells us that we were dead, and now we've been made alive by the power of God. And finally, he tells us one more thing. The question kind of, now what? Now that we've been made alive, well now, thirdly, live for God's glory. You were dead, know you were dead, behold the power of God. Point number three, live for God's glory. Look down at verse seven. God's raised us up with Christ, he's seated us with him, he's made us alive so that what? In order that what? In the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So the way that Paul is writing here, it sounds like God made us alive and raised us up and seated us in heaven for what purpose? Ultimately. For his glory, right? He did it so that he could show off, through Jesus Christ, he could show off his grace forever and ever and ever. That's the ultimate grounding and the ultimate reason, the ultimate goal and motivation of our salvation is the glory of God through Jesus Christ. And if you are doubting for one second that any of this comes through Jesus and Jesus alone, I would encourage you to read Ephesians 1 and 2 this afternoon and just observe how many times in Christ, through Christ, by Christ, Paul says, how many times he says that. Every good blessing, every good thing that we have comes through Jesus. So God, through Christ, brings himself glory by saving sinners like you and like me. That's remarkable. Because God is holy and righteous and just, and he could get a heck of a lot of glory for himself by only showing off his righteousness for the rest of eternity by damning everybody. And he would be good in doing that. But praise be to his name that he has determined that he will get more glory by saving a bunch of people, including you and me if we're trusting in his son. God is passionate about his glory. And he has attached his glory to the salvation of sinners. That puts rock under our feet. Like this is really, really good news. If you have ever struggled with assurance and thinking, ah, oh my gosh, I battle with sin all the time. I'm still, I see a lot of wickedness in my heart. I, can, I don't do the things I want to do and I do the things I don't want to do. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Like Paul writes in Romans 7, if you've ever felt that, God's passion for his glory and the fact that he glorifies himself in saving you is really good news for you. Because God is not going to give away his glory. He, he cares about it too much. 
and he's going to be glorified in saving you and bringing you home to heaven. This is rock under our feet when we struggle and we get our butts kicked by sin all the time. And when we despair of how difficult life is, remember these truths. Look down at verse 8. And the way that God makes sure that he gets all the glory for our salvation is in, contained here in these next couple of verses where he says, By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. So positively, we are saved by grace through faith. Or to put it in another way, we are saved by unmerited favor, simply by trusting the promises of God in Jesus. Put negatively, which Paul does, he does both, he says that we're not saved as a result of anything in us or as a result of anything that we have done. He wants to make it crystal clear. That phrase that's rendered, this is not your own doing there, in verse 8, literally reads, this is not from you or this is not of you. So that's where I'm getting this from, that it's not anything in us or of us, and it's nothing we've done right there in verse 9, not a result of works. So Paul leaves absolutely nothing to human beings when it comes to accomplishing salvation. Nothing. Righteousness comes from the mercy of God alone. It's accomplished through Christ alone, and it is applied and received through faith alone. This gift of God here that Paul talks about is your salvation, like in its entirety. That's the gift of God. Like if you're wondering, why, why did I repent of sin when, the, when this other person that I know didn't do it? What's, God gave you a gift. Why did I trust in Christ when somebody else that I know hasn't? It's because God gave you a gift called faith. Your faith is not of your own. It's not of you. The Lord has given you your salvation. And all of this, Paul says there at the end of verse 9, look back down at it. It serves the purpose that no one may boast. So it's not of you, anything that you are or anything that you've done. It's not any of that. It's the gift of God so that no one can boast. See, Paul and the Holy Spirit inspiring Paul, the Holy Spirit of God knows our hearts. So God knows that if, if there's anything that we can contribute to our salvation... There's always going to be room for boasting because if we think we've done something, we're going to congratulate ourselves for it because that's just how we work. That's how we operate and function. And friend, I tell you this, we will not spend eternity in heaven congratulating each other for the good decisions that we make. We will spend eternity in heaven praising God for his mercy, praising God for his love, praising God for his sovereign grace that he lavished upon us when we were dead. That's the way the Bible speaks. That's the way it tastes and the way it feels. Paul wants to leave no room for us to rob God of any of the glory that he deserves and any of the glory that he wants. Because God means to get it all. And it's good that he gets it all. Because we exist for his glory. So I hope that when you talk about how you got saved, you're careful to talk about it in such a way that you make it really clear that you didn't do anything. Like that this is a, a merciful, sovereign act of Almighty God on your behalf and that you tell people that and that you don't rob God of his glory. I hope that we are all people who can say, nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to what? To the cross I cling. That's true. We bring nothing other than our sin. So if you want to think that you contributed something, there you go. There's a little something. You contributed your sin. God gave everything else. So look down at verse 10 as we, as we wrap this up. There's one other thing we need to consider. So in verse 10, Paul says, For because we are his workmanship, we're God's workmanship, we're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. So this phrase there, created in Christ Jesus, that's referring to the new birth. That we're new creations in Christ. That's what that is. So all of our good works, because we are to do good works, all of them, the ones that please God, they too are a result of grace. And how is that so? Well, look at the text. God prepared them beforehand. And you may think, well, how on earth can a work that hasn't even been done yet be prepared beforehand? 
Again, those are some of the mysteries of the Bible. You just can't understand it perfectly, but it's what it says. God has prepared the works that you will do that are good, that will bring him glory. He's prepared them so that you might walk in them. So, friend, we have got to understand the place of good works in the Christian life. Because I think largely in evangelical Christianity in America, we don't get that very well at all. We either act like they mean nothing, you know, so it's just like it's all of grace, it's all of love, what I do doesn't matter. It's like licentiousness. Any talk of personal holiness is legalism. You hear that a little bit. But what you hear more, especially in the Bible Belt, you get this emphasis on works and obedience, kind of like we referenced earlier. And you act as though that the works are what produce the salvation. That's wrong. It's backwards. God saves us in order to do the good works. We're not saved by the good works. Or to put it another way, we work from our salvation, not for our salvation. So we've got to have this crystallized in our minds or we're going to really be wrecked every time we open the Bible and read the things that we're supposed to do. And we're going to confuse the stuff out of people if, if you know, we're talking to them about how they're made right with God and we keep talking about all this good work stuff before we're talking about being made righteous in Jesus. So here at the very end, put your eyes back up on verse 1 for me. Where Paul says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. So you want to know how good our God is? Look at this. We once walked how? We walked in death. We walked in trespasses. We walked in sin. We were dead, and now God has made us alive in Christ. And now, how do we walk? How do we walk? Look down at verse 10. We walk in the good works now that God has prepared for us. You see that? We walk in such a way that we bring this God glory now. That's pretty cool. We walked in death in a way that dishonored him, and now we walk in a way that is characterized by life and in a way that brings God glory. Friends, this is wonderful news. We were slaves of Satan, and we were rebels against God, and because of this, we were dead. And we deserved wrath and we deserved hell. But God, being rich in love and mercy, sent his son to make us alive in order to show off his grace. So think about this this afternoon. We were enemies. Now we've been adopted as children. And we've got a great inheritance coming. It's called the kingdom of God. And in the meantime, between now and then, between now and when we're going to be glorified forever and dwell with God forever, we get to do good works to the praise of God's glory. That's good news. It's the gospel. So let's pray. Our Father, we are astonished by your grace and we pray that we would be all the more so as we think about these great truths that we've seen in your word this morning. We pray that you would continue to break our hearts for the sin that still exists in our lives, but that you would give us rock-solid confidence in the promises that you've made for us. And we pray that you would make us people who speak accurately about salvation and accurately about what we were and accurately about what you've done to save us. And we pray that you would use our words to save many. And we pray that we would be people who walk in these good works that you have prepared for us in order that we might bring you glory. And we pray that you would do it all in Jesus' name. Amen.